All right, so we're going to get started. Just a little about me. My name is Sarah Devitt, and I work for the Montana Office of Rural Health, also our Area Health Education Center. We are so lucky to have Jane and Elizabeth present for our Smiles for Life, Why Oral Health Must Be a Part of the PCMH. Just a little about our authors before we get started. Uh, Jane Gillette is a researcher and policy consultant. Dr. Gillette is a nationally recognized leader in primary oral disease prevention, health disparities, and evidence-based dentistry. She serves, or has served, in a leadership capacity, including board appointment with many health organizations, including the American Dental Association, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, and the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research-funded practice-based research networks. Dr. Gillette is an editor of the Journal of Evidence-Based Dental Practice and developer and director of both the Infant Oral Health Program, Access to Baby and Child Dentistry Montana, and Montana School-Based Sealant Program, Sealants for Smiles. Elizabeth Kenyon is also joining us. Uh, Dr. Kenyon is a professor of nursing at Montana State University in Bozeman. While at the University of Akron, and prior to coming to Montana State, Dr. Kenyon became a certified family nurse practitioner who developed a nurse-managed center. While in this role, she became aware <coughs> of the urgent need to provide dental and oral health services. She partnered with the local health department to provide dental care. After 10 years as director of the center, she returned to Montana with a passion to address oral health issues of vulnerable persons. Her funded program of research addresses interventions to improve the oral health among American Indians in Montana. All right, I am going to give uh, Jane the control so we can all see her wonderful PowerPoint. Jane, are you ready? I am ready. Awesome, thank you. Let me know when you can see my screen. Alrighty. And then I will begin. Perfect. All right, I can see your screen. Nice. <laughs> well, thanks for the wonderful introduction, Sarah. And I am um, thrilled to be um, presenting with my good friend and colleague, Elizabeth Kenyon, and um, look forward to hearing questions at the end of this presentation. Um, so everyone, I would guess, has a little bit of a, a different background who's calling in today. So I think that you'll have the opportunity, if you want to, to um, real-time um, type in questions to Sarah, and we can review those later on. But I'll, I'll do my best to present to a broad category of people. Um, so the title of this is Why Oral Health Must Be Part of a Patient-Centered Medical Home. And we'll, if you're not familiar with the term patient-centered medical home, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, at the end of this presentation, we will have discussed the impact of oral disease on oral, overall health, why Montana medical professionals must be engaged in oral health, how it fits into the patient-centered medical home model, and how you can start implementing oral health practices in the primary care setting even tomorrow. Now, you might have um, been hearing in the news that there is, in fact, quite a large correlation between oral disease and systemic disease. And it seems like just every day there's something um, printed in the news, and these are just a few of the examples that are out there. And you might have heard of some of them, but some of them might be news to you as well. But there's actually a correlation between poor oral health and obesity, between periodontal disease and um, heart disease. Now, the correct term for periodontal disease is periodontal disease. The layman's term is gum disease, and sometimes I'll use those, change, those terms interchangeably, but they really mean the same thing. Periodontal disease is, can be both a, a chronic and an acute gum infection. Uh, we also know that there's a very strong correlation between diabetes and uh, gum disease. And it's, it's really interesting that when we treat somebody's um, gum disease who's diabetic, we can actually reduce their hemoglobin A1C. And this news clipping is actually looking at hospitalization and medical costs associated with diabetic patients when you treat them for gum disease versus when you don't treat them for gum disease. 
And lastly, a really interesting um, area that's in the news quite frequently is uh, pregnancy outcomes and gum disease. And this one is actually um, reporting on uh, your ability to become pregnant and whether you have gum disease or not. So all really, really fascinating. Uh, at some point in our um, thought processes, the mouse became detached from the rest of the body. But um, we can, in fact, look at um, the mouth as really a mirror into the rest of the body about what might be going on. And the impact of poor oral health can be really devastating, and the prevalence is quite significant. In fact, uh, don't carry, so that's the true term, um, but you might hear it called cavities or tooth decay. They all mean the same thing. But dental caries is the single most chronic childhood disease. It's seven times more common than hay fever, 11 times more common than asthma. And as we just discussed in the previous slide, um, gum disease or periodontal disease is um, very strongly correlated to um, other systemic chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Annually, there's over 30,000 uh, oral cancers diagnosed and about 8,000 um, individuals die annually from, from uh, cancer in the mouth. And particularly those that are at risk are those that um, smoke and drink alcohol together. Lastly, about 50% of our geriatric population are reporting that they have poor or very poor oral health, which is really sad in my mind considering that we have a large aging demographic <laughs> um, among us right now, and that 33% are reporting that they have untreated decay. The consequences of poor oral health are, are severe, and we don't really have time to go over all of them, but some of them are intuitive and some of them may be less intuitive. But, of course, when you look at the picture in the right-hand corner, that's a dental abscess in the baby's mouth. So uh, what you're looking at there, the correct clinical term is called early childhood caries, but it goes by a lot of slang terms like baby bottle tooth decay, nursing caries, bottle rot. But it all means the same thing. It's a pattern of very severe cavities in young children. And the only treatment for that is what you see below that picture. Um, especially with a child that young, is to have them go to sleep to have their teeth pulled or capped or fillings put in. Um, certainly, <laughs> this is not a way to manage a chronic disease, right? That's like saying that we're going to wait for somebody to have a heart attack before we actually treat the heart disease. So um, this, is, this is why it's so important to integrate um, oral health into primary care. So uh, you can imagine when you see toothaches like that that it's very hard for children to focus in school when their mouth is in pain and adults miss um, a significant amount of work, of course, from toothaches. Often um, the uninsured populations that we have that, um, that in, in Montana right now, as far as dental insurance goes, are the... Um, the adults, young adults particularly, and they have truthfully, and there's a really nice report that came out recently from the department um, looking at dental uh, utilization um, in emergency departments, and we can see that it's this population that's really accessing, um, is really accessing our emergency departments. Of course, you can imagine that you have trouble eating if your teeth hurt like this, so adequate nutrition, nutrition, not just for children, but for the elderly as well, um, can be a significant issue. You can also imagine if you're a child and you have little black rotten teeth or caps on your teeth or no teeth at all because they've been um, pulled out. You might have difficulty with um, speech development, language, of course, and just feel really not very good about your smile. And of course, all of this results in significant costs, not just to the patient, but to our society as well. Often when people have toothaches, they turn to self-medication, um, you know, whatever they have in their their, uh, their little drug um, box at home, and this is actually probably one of the saddest examples that I've seen of self-medication, and this was a, a pregnant woman who was taking excessive quantities of Tylenol because she had a toothache and was unable to get care for her toothache. Um, her baby died from liver toxicity, and she um, was flown to uh, Pittsburgh to get a liver transplant. So unfortunately, that's what many of our adult patients and even sometimes child patients will turn to with, with toothaches without appropriate care. Lastly, and uh, it doesn't hardly seem possible, but um, it does happen every year that we do have individuals that pass away from toothaches or complications from toothaches. This is probably one of the saddest um, cases. Uh, the one driver, um, he passed away from a toothache on a grown-up back tooth that could have been treated with a dental sealant. One of probably the saddest pieces about this is that he had a medical home, um, and yet he didn't have a dental home. So he had many um, opportunities to see physicians and was in care with physicians, but um, was not in care within a dental home. 
nationally, um, it bogs down, of course, our hospitals and emergency departments. This is a recent study that was published that looked at toothaches uh, from 2000 to 2008 and noted that there was a 40% increase in hospitalizations, actually, um, from toothaches. And, in fact, in 2008 alone was over 8,000, of which uh, 66 of those patients died in the hospital, resulting in a little, uh, about $858 million in care. Um, many of them um, Medicaid, <laughs> and some of them uh, Medicare, and then, of course, the uninsured. In our emergency departments, um, we are certainly experiencing there's some really interesting data coming out right now, um, looking at that emergency department data and finding a trend that's actually increased dental utilization of emergency departments for preventive dental, prevented, preventable dental conditions, um, and that a uh, number is actually increasing, particularly in our young adult population, and that's the population that's most likely to uh, be newly off of their family's dental insurance and on their own and not making a lot of money. <laughs> so that group is actually increasing nationally, which is really fascinating. But in this study that was published in JADA this uh, past year, it noted uh, 4 million emergency department visits between 2008 and 2010, which represented about 1% and um, a little under half of those were uninsured patients. You can imagine the cost of the healthcare system when that happens. And in fact, 101 of those patients died um, with a chart with charges um, a little less than three billion dollars. And when you hear data like this, you might think to yourself, like, "Oh my gosh, where are the headlines on this?" <laughs> because it's uh, it's quite significant and severe. So, um, just to follow up on, on um, this topic, I mean, I think the take home here would be that many of our patients have medical homes, and yet they don't have medical home, or they don't have dental homes. And that um, dentists, not just in Montana, but nationally, feel um, a little a little bit unsure about their abilities to treat special populations, so very young children, pregnant women, geriatric patients, patients with um, special health care needs. And physicians um, who, who do believe that it's quite um, important to, um, to think about oral health, um, and yet 50% have really had very little to no oral health education in uh, medical school. Only 9% in a study that was done could actually answer some four pretty simple questions about oral health uh, correctly, and clinicians had received over the course of their career only roughly about two hours in oral health training. And you layer upon that that there's really very, in our healthcare system, very little medical dental um, collaboration. We um, have these, these um, um, healthcare systems pretty well siloed, um, a lot of private dental offices and many um, medical practitioners working in rural health clinics, community health centers, large group practices, hospitals. Um, and then if you just layer on the issue of that there's um, more people with medical coverage than there is dental coverage, um, you can imagine how it, it's no wonder that patients aren't really accessing dental health care services to the extent that they're accessing medical services. I'm going to turn the um, reins over to my colleague, Elizabeth Kenyon, who's going to chat a little bit about the status of medical education and collaboration between medical and dental practitioners in our healthcare system. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, too, for everyone that is tuned in. And, you know, certainly we know that medical and um, all healthcare education is changing, but as this slide uh, indicated, there is a disconnect with 62% of OBGYN residency programs um, providing no prenatal oral health education. Uh, more than 50% of the pediatric residencies have two hours or less of oral health education. Only about 32% of family medicine residency directors are satisfied with the residency's competency in oral health. And I can speak from my personal experience. I do think that we're in even worse uh, shape than the medical education in terms of nursing uh, education, uh, including oral health education. Um, I'm only... You know, even in our own College of Nursing here, we have just begun to introduce that. So with that in mind, I do think that it's important to 
uh, let you know that we aren't just standing still, but we really are trying to move uh, throughout uh, the state and national meetings. We're trying to move the educational uh, programs forward, and we're changing. So that we're not only focusing on the science of our profession, but also we're focusing on relationships and with, uh, we're helping our students uh, learn to communicate not only within our discipline, but also with and across other disciplines. And I think this slide says it very well. Uh, in terms of we do have to have, our students do have to have a deep understanding of one field, but then they also have to have this ability to uh, communicate in languages across a broader range of disciplines. And then when we think about um, kind of in the olden days about her, how care was delivered, um, we, you know, care, you know, if you were ill or if you needed uh, oral health care, you went either to a, you know, primarily to a dentist. But now uh, with that change, what we're doing is we're <clears throat> focusing um, not only on how care is delivered, but what care is delivered. And um, as we think about the patient-centered medical home, what we're trying to do, among other things, is provide a wraparound services for this patient so that we can kind of be uh, the ones that are, are helping them uh, to get all of their care met. And in uh, 2010, there was a Lancet Commission uh, on Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century that recognizes that health professionals have made contributions to health and the socioeconomic development in the past century. But ultimately, if we are going to have reform, it's going to have to begin with a change in our mindset. And we need to acknowledge what the challenges are. And we have to be willing uh, to participate in open debate and dialogue uh, to make these changes. And I think this slide illustrates that really nicely, not only the changes that we know that are happening in the field, but the movement that is also con um, coll a collaborative effort among the physicians, physician assistants, dentists, registered nurses, advanced practice nurses, and so on. And you know, in order for the education to change, then uh, the National Interprofessional Institute Initiative on Oral Health has been engaging the clinicians and also really engaging the educators so that we can, as we're planning the curriculums and working um, in the educational arenas, we are not only looking at what uh, outcomes we anticipate our students should have, but also what the primary care practitioners are needing, uh, the terms of professional standards and so on. And then what does all of this mean to patients? Because patients um, also are, the, with the flux of the system and the overall change of the system, our patients also are, are going to re, uh, require some education about how this new healthcare system works. Okay, I think the next slide. Uh, and so when we talk about interprofessional healthcare, what we're actually talking about is enhancing the public or the community's access to oral health care through the connections that <clears throat> we know about their oral health and their general health. And it's in this way, then, that we, as healthcare providers, we're really all colleagues in each other's profession. And so as profession, uh, professions and especially professional educators, we're focusing on these policy, curricular, and accreditation changes. So when we talk about interprofessional education, this is where we have the students from two or more of our professions um, coming together. We actually have opportunities where they have education 
in the same classroom. They have education in the same simulation labs where they can have uh, authentic uh, practice clinical situations where they can learn from each other with the hope and anticipation that then when they graduate, they will be um, really true interprofessional team members where they share uh, in cooperation, collaboration, and um, focusing that wraparound services for their patients. Okay. Nay. Nice. Well, I think um, Elizabeth speaks well to the fact that we have large system changes that are happening right now on the national level, of course on the state level, that will give us all opportunities for more interprofessional collaboration to move oral health forward in Montana and of course across the nation as well. Um, already in Montana, and there's many providers that are doing oral health activities in the primary care setting, and um, there's some really interesting data about our own Montana population um, that would motivate us to do so. Um, some of it comes from surveys that are, are done here uh, periodically through Montana. So, uh, sorry, there's a, there might be a typo on that. Oh, no, that is 2008. My apologies. So here we're looking um, at the Montana National Children's Health Survey from 2008. And the gradient is really interesting here, actually. Um, it almost um, follows exactly um, the income categories that are here. So what you're noticing here is a significantly um, less, about probably 25 percentage points less um, if you are you know, below 100% uh, of the federal poverty, poverty level, you're reporting that your children do not have as good of health as you do if you are 400% of the poverty level. Um, and it almost just perfectly mirrors um, a stepwise gradient there, where you can see that those living in poverty suffer um, disproportionately more oral disease. And this is like for many other chronic diseases as well, so I suppose it shouldn't surprise us, but it's um, interesting to see our own data. Similarly, these are families that are reporting one or more oral health problems um, in their children. And if you're poor, uh, about 30% of families are uh, reporting that their children have more problems compared to about 13% for higher income families. Preventive dental visits, it follows that same gradient with uh, wealthier families, their children having more preventive dental visits than um, lower income families. The good news is, is within our Medicaid enrolled populations, we've actually been having, since 2007, as far back as I've been tracking it, uh, we've actually been having increases in the number of um, dental services and dental visits that en enrolled children have had. So about a 92% increase um, in um, EBSTED services, dental services for children who've been enrolled longer than 90 days. So that's a really positive step in my mind in the right direction, even though we still have disparities between low income and um, high income families, uh, we are certainly seeing some progress. Now, I'm not totally sure of everyone's background on this um, webinar today, but PROWNS is a really, really interesting um, survey that's done nationally. Unfortunately, Montana is one of, I think, if I remember right, about five states that don't do it on a um, continuing basis. So we've only done a one time, point in time one at 2002, and it looks at lots of different factors related to um, pregnancy and risk, and one of them um, was oral health. And so the data that you're looking at here is actually comparing um, the three questions related to oral health that the pregnant women were asked, or the you know, previously pregnant women were asked, and um, compares that data to Colorado, who actually had fairly similar um, results as we did. And the interesting thing to note here is what the question is asking, the one over to the far left, it's asking the women, um, while you were pregnant, did you have dental problems? Um, and you know, did you get to visit the dentist is the next one over. But um, women that were reporting, were reporting dental problems, you can see that there's a discrepancy there between um, Colorado, which had similar um, characteristics as Montana did and results as Montana did. Uh, another really interesting thing, though I don't have the slide on it, was that when this was looked at, there was actually 
a, um, a correlation between women who had reported having dental problems while they were pregnant and who had low birth weight preterm delivery babies, uh, and that's with Montana data. Looking at our BRSSS, which is done um, periodically through Montana, this is one of the surveys that we do regularly and frequently. And so this one is actually looking at adults, asking adults, have you ever had a permanent tooth extracted? And you can still see that same gradient where those living in poverty have significantly more <laughs> um, likelihood of having their teeth extracted versus those who come from wealthier backgrounds. When we look at our aging population, uh, those that have had all their teeth <laughs> removed, um, again, you can see that same gradient with those uh, who are um, living in poverty, having the largest amount of all of their natural teeth extracted versus those who are at higher income. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, more teeth are lost due to gum disease, or remember the correct term is periodontal disease, than from tooth decay. Um, and tooth decay, uh, sorry, and gum disease can actually be treated pretty successfully with special gum cleanings. And when we treat gum disease or periodontal disease, it actually turns out that we have reduced medical costs as well. Um, depending on the chronic disease that we're talking about or pregnancy, it can have different cost savings. There's actually, it was just published, I actually think this month, in um, the Journal of Public Health where this data was officially published looking at cost savings when we do treat people for gum disease so we don't let them have all their teeth extracted. Um, what are the medical cost savings that we can experience? So now we're going to turn to the patient-centered medical home and I'm not totally sure of everybody's background, so it's worth just to um, chat for a minute about what a patient-centered medical home is. A uh, patient-centered medical home is a real thing. Uh, it's not just a concept or an idea. Um, organizations actually work towards patient-centered medical home um, status. And if you're interested in learning about that, we actually have an organization with, within Montana that houses that, um, that process for Montana organizations. Uh, many of the CHCs in Montana probably either have patient-centered medical home status or are close to acquiring it. Um, hospitals often have it. Large group practices often have it. Um, but it's more than just sort of a, a philosophical concept. It's actually a thing <laughs> that you can work towards um, being certified as. The qualities of it is that it's an ongoing relationship, um, usually with a physician, but it represents both continuous and comprehensive care, where you have a physician that might be leading the team um, and taking responsibility for ongoing patient care, and the team approaches the healthcare needs of, the, of that individual um, with a whole person concept. Um, so not just focusing in on you know, just the diabetes, but also paying attention to the mental health needs and uh, maybe the housing needs or food insecurity. So it's much larger than just taking care of a person's, let's say, diabetic needs. The care is coordinated against, uh, uh, or across many disciplines, um, so that quite frequently will involve things like patient navigators, for instance, to assist um, in coordination of care. Sometimes they're called care coordinators, um, but it involves large teams in a community that care for the needs of the whole person. It has, of course, um, an ongoing commitment to quality and safety um, by careful care planning based on um, evidence-based guidelines and informed evidence-based decision-making, and availability of, um, of services. So, for instance, it would be quite, um, quite common to see like either open access scheduling or um, open on Saturdays, things like that. So we're meeting, again, um, that person where they're at instead of having that person bend to the system that we've developed. And lastly, uh, patient-centered medical home focuses on, and this is probably the least developed of the patient um, centered medical home right now, but um, that concept that what we do, all the the points that I just mentioned, that we would be reimbursed in a, fa in a fashion that supports that type of care. So what 
does it look like when we integrate oral health into the patient-centered medical home? Well, the first thing is, is it's patient-centered. Again, we look at the whole person. We essentially put the mouth back into the body. <laughs> we focus on self-management, uh, self-management goal settings, prevention, really engaging the patient in improving their oral health. It's also comprehensive. So again, instead of just focusing on the diabetes, we reach out um, to other aspects of healthcare that have typically been siloed. So for instance, mental health would be a great example, but also dentistry. So it brings oral health into the primary care setting, even though that's typically been a, um, a siloed aspect within healthcare. So probably a better way to think of the patient-centered medical home would maybe even to call it a patient-centered health home. So that would include both dental, medical, mental health, everything that a person needs for full health and well-being. Of course, it's coordinated and involves a larger professional team to um, care for the patient, um, nurses, physicians, mental health specialists, um, PAs, hygienists, dentists, and that it's accessible. So when you bring oral health services into the primary care setting, um, it's wonderful because now we have a golden opportunity to do oral health education. We can screen for um, oral diseases, which we know now sometimes correlate to systemic health as well. And when we bring oral health services into the primary care setting, um, we can bring in services such as, which we'll talk about later, like fluoride treatments, which are very, very effective at um, at managing and preventing dental decay. Lastly, it focuses on a systems-based approach to quality and safety. So um, currently, dentistry has many, many evidence-based guidelines, um, specifically with respect to uh, topical fluorides and fluoride use. Um, so really bringing those evidence-based approaches and quality measures into the primary care setting. And it really does fit in the rest of what we do, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so in this, uh, this is what we could say and do for pretty much any disease, right? So everybody starts out life with blank and needs it or them to function throughout life. Disease dysfunction, blank, is common, yet preventable by individual behavior. Etiology of blank disease is complex and includes social and personal factors. Prevention of blank disease is less expensive than treatment. Teamwork and con consultation are helpful in maximizing blank care. And we could fill in the blank with, let's say, heart disease. So everyone starts out with a heart and needs it uh, to function throughout life. Disease, dysfunction of the heart is common yet preventable by individual behavior. Etiology of heart disease is complex and includes social and personal factors. Prevention of heart disease is less expensive than treatment. Teamwork and consultation are helpful in maximizing cardiac care. And it all helps fits in. <laughs> exactly what we would do in the primary care setting. Um, it's just that we substitute out heart and we add uh, teeth in. So everybody starts out life with teeth and needs them to function throughout life. Uh, disease of teeth is common yet preventable by individual behavior. The etiology of oral disease is complex and includes social and personal factors. The prevention of oral disease is less expensive than treatment and teamwork and consultation are helpful in maximizing oral health care. And we have many, many opportunities um, within the primary care setting to, um, to deliver oral health mes messages and to uh, intervene in a meaningful way for oral health. So for instance, um, we would do the right thing. We would do oral health risk assessment in the primary care setting, counseling on diet. We would do anticipatory guidance. It's the right time, so we could do it at well, um, well visits for adults, children, prenatal, and it's from the uh, right team, from a primary care team. Uh, even though that might sound a little bit unusual, we usually expect the dental team to do that, um, but the, the medical team has many more, as we're going to see in the next slide, many more opportunities to provide this care. And we know that about 30% of our population actually doesn't even access the dental delivery system. And many of them um, don't even know that they have a disease, um, which you can help in identifying, and they don't know that even the disease is preventable. 
risk and the results, of course, that we would expect from um, integrating oral health into primary care would be positive behavior change and self-responsibility. You can see that there's many opportunities to have oral health interventions in uh, the primary care setting. So, for instance, prenatal visits, that's an amazing time. Women are really, really motivated to make changes um, for their babies during that time, and that's, a sad, that's one of my favorite times, actually, <laughs> to introduce oral health. While child checks, um, there's significantly more well, well child checks than dental visits, um, and that's, of course, a wonderful time to introduce oral health. Children and teens is yet another, um, plus sick visits, of course, <laughs> you can try. <laughs> um, adults have annual visits, um, uh, annual physicals, and geriatric patients that are admitted to long-term care facilities, um, they require, as part of the uh, um, minimal data, data set, they actually require um, some kind of oral health assessment every 30 days. And then there's, of course, um, special visits <laughs> uh, to uh, specialty providers, emergency visits. So lots and lots of or, um, opportunities within the medical care setting to introduce oral health concepts and interventions. One of the easiest things to introduce um, is actually fluoride varnish. And you can, if you're not familiar with fluoride varnish, you can sort of think of it as um, an immunization for the mouth. Um, so, for instance, if you, know, you might discuss um, at a flu visit shot, you might discuss doing hand washing, give the flu visit or the flu shot to prevent the flu. Um, if you're at, let's say, a well baby visit, you might be discussing brushing teeth, and you might consider applying fluoride varnish to help prevent cavities. Um, similar to the flu makes you sick, so does dental decay. And um, a curious uh, risk history, dental hygiene advice, dental referral, varnish, all those can be made um, made really easily into your daily workflow in a primary care office, similar to how vaccines can go. So what you can do to um, start integrating oral health into the primary care setting is my advice would be start with children. <laughs> it's actually really, really easy. Um, and there's a lot of science behind it, too. So one of the easiest things to do is to begin applying fluoride varnish in the primary care setting. Um, there's a ton of scientific evidence, all very high quality. Um, here's just some examples of them. But um, fluoride varnish, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the most effective ways to prevent decay in both infants and in adults, actually. Fluoride in general is just super effective. It, it seems like we brush our teeth because we want fresh breath, we want white teeth. The truth is, is we brush our teeth with fluoride and toothpaste to prevent cavities. And some of the dramatic decreases that we've seen in dental decay over the decades have actually been due to water fluoridation, community water fluoridation, and also as simple as it sounds, tooth brushing with fluoridated toothpaste. Fluoride varnish is really easy to apply. We'll look at this a little bit more um, later, but um, this looks pretty easy, and it actually is. And it's um, just like an immunization um, or a flu shot, it's uh, easy to integrate into your normal routine. Many states um, encourage uh, medical providers to apply fluoride varnish, so what you're looking at here is all the states that um, actually pay. Medicaid um, pays in Montana and in many other states for uh, physicians to apply fluoride varnish. And so if there's a map looking, and you, you, it's pretty interesting. Most, <laughs> most of the states actually do. And Montana does as well. So here's how it works in Montana. Um, physicians are allowed to be reimbursed in the Medicaid program for, um, for applying fluoride varnish. And of course, just like other um, operations in your practice, you may delegate that uh, to a nurse, um, whoever you think is appropriate in your, in your practice. Um, you're encouraged to do oral health risk assessment. And there are standardized oral health risk assessment tools. And I'll show you, point you in the right direction to find um, the one that would work good for your practice. The dental code that you take is D1206, and you just put that on the CMS um, 1500 uh, form, just like you would your other ones. The reimbursement that you'll be reimbursed from Medicaid is a little less than $20. 
you can um, do this intervention, or at least be paid for this intervention, up to six times per year for children under 21. The recommendation is that you actually start doing it by the time the first tooth erupts. So um, children are susceptible to cavities as soon as the tooth erupts in the mouth. And cavities can go really, really fast in um, small baby teeth. The mammal is thinner, and it's less mineralized. And so children get cavities on baby teeth very quickly compared to adult teeth. So as soon as the first tooth erupts is the recommendation. And then, of course, during these um, appointments where you're doing oral health risk assessment and you're likely doing some type of oral health counseling and you're um, placing fluoride varnish, you're also asking them whether the child has a dental home. And if not, you're making an appropriate referral. So here's how it might look <laughs> in your practice. The first thing that you want to do is educate all your staff, including the front desk personnel, train all the clinicians on fluoride varnish application procedures, identify who in your office is going to be the champion. So that's the person that's going to understand all the billing piece, what the supplies are, come up with the protocol of you know how it's going to be done, where the supplies are going to be kept, make sure that the correct entry is made in an electronic medical record. Uh, you'll store the supplies in the exam room, or sometimes I've seen offices, they just have a little portable kit that they take from um, exam room to exam room. And then, of course, in your electronic health record, it helps to have a little template that has a risk assessment tool embedded in it and that has um, documentation of the oral health education that you're giving, um, referrals if you're doing it, the consent, and that you place the fluoride varnish. You have to update your billing form so that you actually have the varnish code on there to make it easy for you to take the code. And then um, there's some wonderful handouts, and we'll go over them later, but there's some wonderful handouts to give to families. And some um, organizations actually have them in their electronic health record, and they just print them off real time, but some of them are stocking them in their exam rooms. So the, the steps for how it would go um, would be you'd start with identifying all eligible patients. So like let's say maybe you're um, a family practice and you'd like to start doing fluoride varnish for all children under six years of age or all children under 21, <laughs> you know, whatever your parameters are going to be. So then you're going to figure out who are those patients in your panel. Uh, you'll do a risk assessment in there. And again, I'll show you where to go for tools about standardized risk assessments. There are ones for medical practitioners to use. You'll do some kind of oral hygiene, diet counseling, anticipatory guidance. That's um, sometimes done by the physician, but truthfully, I've also seen it done by the, the nurse or the qualified um, personnel as well. Applying the fluoride varnish can certainly be um, delegated to a medical assistant or, or a nurse or a PA. Uh, writing of fluoride prescriptions, um, that of course is, is done by the physician. Referral to a dentist, that can happen up at the front desk. And everybody is responsible for documenting um, things properly in the electronic health records. And then um, bill for the reimbursement, and that would be done, of course, under the physician's um, number. Ms. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth is going to um, take it from here because we're going to start introducing you into where would you go if you want to learn more about oral health and integrating oral health into the primary care setting. Yeah, I think it could be just a bit overwhelming thinking, oh my gosh, we have all of these changes, all of this is happening, and just where do I start? And we're really fortunate because there are some major organizations that have stepped up to the plate and have really identified, uh, not only identified the need, but have identified just a plethora of resources that are available to us. So one of the... Uh, One's is the Oral Health Nursing Education uh, and Practice Group, and that's out of um, New York University. And they have uh, materials that are for nurses, but also materials for uh, educational materials that would be appropriate for patients, appropriate for clinics, um, uh, materials that also uh, relate to specific pathologies. So I would highly recommend um, this uh, website as one of your, maybe your initial source or one of your primary sources. 
Uh, for example, currently on their website they have uh, one that is chemo without cavities, oral health care for children with cancer, or babying our babies, promoting oral health in infants. So in addition to the videos, they also have presentations, they have publications. Uh, I think they have five very recent publications from uh, 2014 and they also have uh, links. But one of the uh, one, uh, curriculum that they have that I think is just really excellent is the Smiles for Life, a national oral health curriculum. And uh, this curriculum is one that we used in the College of Nursing to introduce oral health to the students that are in our uh, graduate program. And the students really enjoyed the program. They felt like they have learned a lot. And I, th I think it's just a real nice way to, to really introduce yourself as well as others about oral health. Yeah, I would agree. So this is the uh, front page of the Smiles for Life curriculum. And it is an excellent curriculum. So what you'll see over on the right-hand side are the eight modules that are offered. My recommendation would be that everybody does um, course one. So that's the relationship of um, oral health to systemic health. And then depending on what world you live in, <laughs> you might consider um, some of the other modules. So for instance, there's one on pregnancy and oral health. There's medical, um, like acute dental problems, so emergency care, geriatric care, and of course, um, as we've been talking about here, there is um, pediatric oral health as well. The curriculum is endorsed by um, just about everybody you can think of. The American Academy of Pediatrics, of course, the American Dental Association, National Association of School Nurses, um, you name it, they've endorsed it. It's just a fabulous curriculum, um, particularly meant for um, non-dental professionals, but as you'll see in a little bit, even um, dental professionals are actually uh, taking these courses as well. Uh, you can see since the time that it was developed in 2010, it's had a ton of usage. And um, specifically across the nation, it seems like the East Coast gets, uh, has had a lot of traffic on it. And there's little Montana um, with maybe not as many registered users, but we're hoping that that will change. For the most part, it's um, those who are working in the medical profession, so physicians' assistants, um, physicians, nurses, and then to a smaller extent, those working in dentistry. It turns out that the participants actually really, really um, enjoy the content. Like um, like Elizabeth had noted, the uh, doctor of nursing, nurse practitioner, they loved the curriculum. Um, they did all eight modules <laughs> as well and had great feedback about it. So with respect to introducing pediatric oral health into the primary care setting, so into the patient-centered medical home, um, this is probably one of the key modules that you would want to go to. It has links to the CARES risk assessment tool that you would um, use in your practice. If you go to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they actually have a template for you to copy and to paste into your electronic health record so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, by the way, has absolutely stellar um, uh, resources for medical professionals as well. But in here, you will actually learn how to apply for fluoride varnish, when to apply for fluoride varnish, and what appropriate counseling is um, for children and families depending on the age. Here's the basic steps. Um, it's really that easy. Uh, so what you see being done at the top slide is called an, uh, a lap exam or an infant toddler knee to knee exam. But it's where the healthcare provider sits across from mom knee to knee and baby feet faces uh, mom's tummy. And then mom lays baby down into the health provider's lap and holds baby's hands because baby wants to um, pull up at the health provider's hands. And also you can see in that picture that mom is um, holding down baby's legs, too. <laughs> um, it's normal, just like, you know, when you change diapers or try and put them in car seats, they fuss a little bit, and that's totally normal with this age. Um, they fuss with the fluoride varnish. It doesn't taste bad, but it is kind of sticky, um, so they object to it usually because it's, it's sticky. 
After you go through the modules, there's um, post tests that you can take. You do get CME for the modules, and it's free. So there's no cost for doing any of the modules or the CME that's associated with it. You can even download a app. I have not downloaded this app, but I, uh, but I will um, soon. I actually didn't realize that it was available, but I'm, I'm going to promptly uh, be downloading it. And lastly, um, you'll find information to send home with parents, so lots of different handouts, even posters for your waiting room, um, you name it, the resource is on there. And it um, isn't necessarily just for children, it's also for like acute dental problems or um, adult oral health, so it's not just for children if you're not working you know, with kids, but you're working with a different population. So in conclusion, um, oral health really has profound impacts on overall health and well-being and is a large burden to um, not just our patients but really to society as well. That integrating oral health into the patient-centered medical home actually can work <laughs> and fits nicely into the patient-centered medical home model and can easily be implemented, especially with children, into the primary care setting. So now I think we'll pause, hopefully we finished on time, where we can take some questions. Thank you. So I'll let you so, do that. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Thank you girls so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Does anybody have any questions for either of our presenters? And remember, if you do want to ask a question over the line, you'll have to push star six, or you can submit them to the chat box via the GoToWebinar uh, application, and I will read them for you. One question that you that might happen is uh, sometimes practitioners are curious about. Um, how to know how much fluoride is in their water and how to write fluoride prescriptions appropriately. Um, if you contact uh, Tanette Hollingsworth, she's the World Health Program Coordinator at the Department of Public Health and Human Services. If you contact her, she can send you um, a list that will drill down to your community. So for instance, in Bozeman, I can look on this Excel spreadsheet and I can actually tell the trailer park across from Smith's has this much fluoride naturally growing in the water. And when I know that, then I know how much um, of a fluoride prescription, if any, to write for my patients. A lot of people don't know this, but um, fluoride just naturally occurs in the water. And there's many, many areas in Montana that actually just have um, the naturally occurring therapeutic dose in their water. So for instance, communities that pull water off of the Missouri have um, almost precisely the therapeutic amount and actually don't need a fluoride prescription. So um, there's also the ability to test well water too. So sometimes even after looking at that document that Tonette can give you, um, you'll still be unsure about how much fluoride is in there. And um, she could also put you in contact with um, the department within the state health department that will test well water. And they test for all different kinds of things, but one of the things that you can test for is actually fluoride content in water. Awesome. Well, it looks like I have no questions coming in to me. Any comments, not just questions? Anything anybody wants to share or? Sometimes um, communities will, um, I'll get comments that they struggle finding a dentist in their community that will um, care for their Medicaid insured patient. And I just wanted you to know that there is a database, again, on the, um, on the state um, 
DPHHS on their website, the Medicaid website, where you can actually search for provider. And we also have in Montana, we have providers who have had additional training in infant and toddler oral health, and those providers are called ABCD providers. And so those are, um, again, uh, practitioners who have gone through additional training um, specifically for young children. And so those would be great um, to refer young children to. And you can do a search on the um, department's website for ABCD providers too. But you can specifically look in your community for who is taking Medicaid, and that's probably the best way I know how um, to find Medicaid providers in your community. Awesome. So we do have a question and a comment. One comment says, thank you, great info. The question I have are, dental professionals often require medical consultants prior to treatment to avoid liability for negligence. The only circumstance that I know of this happening from medical to dental is prior to chemotherapy. Is this happening or beginning to happen more in the medical community? Mm, yeah, so it depends on, um, my experience is, is that it depends on who the dental practitioner is. So some are very well versed at um, working with special populations and with those that are medically compromised. And some dentists work um, quite closely with the medical profession because of that, just because that's the nature of their dental practice, actually. They pr um, have a strong um, component of their practice that's dedicated to treating medically compromised people or, or um, those with special health care needs. So those ones actually do very, very commonly um, work with medical practitioners for clearance. Um, and um, we're also seeing that within the medical profession, <laughs> actually. And um, as you see healthcare changing nationally, and, I'm, and I apologize, I don't know everybody's background, but um, working with more within accountable care organizations, for instance, um, I think we'll see a lot more of that where physicians and um, other medical providers will be reaching out uh, even to a larger extent to dentists to get medical clearance, uh, right, because we're, we're working now, you know, within an accountable care organization, now you're working under um, one larger system where everybody has to play really well together in order to make that system work. All right, thank you for that answer. I hope that answered that question. <laughs> But, well, as always, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, and anyone that is always welcome to contact me. Uh, my email, it's long, but it's easy. It's <coughs> drgillette, so Dr. Gillette, at sprout, like you sprout a tree, or like your mouth, health.org, so Dr. Gillette at sproutoralhealth.org. And always uh, be happy to answer any questions you might have or if you need technical assistance in your community um, working through <laughs> an oral health issue, I'd be happy to assist with that as well. All right. Thank you so much. Any other questions before we kind of wrap up for the day? All right, I didn't get any more questions. Oh, never mind. That was just a thank you for answering the question. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And um, again, this will be recorded, so if you want to share this with any of your colleagues, all of you listening right now, that would be wonderful. Our It will be on our website. We usually take about a week just to get everything encoded and embedded, so... In a week, it should be online. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take, take care. Bye.